Okay, thanks very much, Alan, and thank you everyone for logging in. So, as Alan said, um, maybe I've been working on some of this stuff for a little bit too long, and uh, maybe I'm a little bit too driven by pretty pictures, um, like the ones that are on the, on the front slide. So I thought, you know, in preparing the talk, maybe I should go back and almost go back to the beginning. And the, what you should do if you're going back to the beginning is to do a Google search. Okay, so you type in and ask Google what it thinks is important about wrinkling. And it's very clear that it's not uh, pretty pictures, but it's much more how to actually get rid of wrinkles or how to make sure wrinkles go away. So the top tip is that uh, the top hit on a Google search is the symptoms and causes of wrinkling. Uh, then people also ask how to get rid of them. Can wrinkles go away? Where are the wrinkles? Blah, 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 blah. So if you click on one of these arrows and say, okay, I'd like, how do I get rid of wrinkles? The answer is wear sunscreen, limit your sugar intake, intake quit smoking. I'm also interested that um, it's suggested that you might try washing your face. Um, bit surprised that that seems to be a serious uh, suggestion. But of course, there are lots of other situations than just our faces that wrinkle. Um, other hits that come up on Google are uh, what happens when you wring, when you paint in a hurry and you don't prepare the surfaces properly, then you also uh, see wrinkling, which may or may not be aesthetically pleasing. But these sort of ideas of thinking about wrinkles as being a bad thing uh, mean that you mean that you're very much interested in questions about the behaviour of wrinkles at threshold, and that's a subject that's been studied uh, for a number of years now. And most or many of the questions that you might ask, particularly about how much or when does how much compression do I need uh, to get wrinkling, and what is the wavelength that I see when wrinkles happen, are for the most part uh, understood. Recently, though, there's also been a series of uh, applications that sort of sought to exploit wrinkling. So just uh, picking a couple of examples more or less at random, uh, Pedro Rice's group, uh, when they were at MIT, were interested in designing surfaces that were able to modify their drag coefficient. And motivated by the uh, golf ball, they were really, they sort of thought that if I could make a surface, a spherical surface that wrinkles, uh, by changing the volume of the, of the sort of area underneath the thin skin, then I can change the amplitude of those wrinkles and hence change the drag coefficient uh, dynamically. So that's what they called smart morphable surfaces. There are other situations where you want to sort of just observe wrinkles to try and uh, determine what's going on in a particular system. And there are a number of situations in cell biology where people are interested in trying to understand the forces that cells use to move. Uh, and the way that they, or one of the ways that they can measure that is by putting a cell, in this case, case a goldfish keratocyte on a, on a very thin polymer surface, and then watching it crawl in a particular direction and looking at the wrinkles that form. And what they're really interested in is trying to understand the sort of magnitude of forces. And at the moment, what they do is they kind of do calibration experiments where they look at the length of these wrinkles and try and infer from some calibration experiment what force is uh, imposed. Now, what I'd like to try and uh, show you in this talk, and what I'd argue is that some of these applications are not really in the, situ in the sort of... Uh, regime that we'd sort of normally understand. So you, you normally think, okay, this is a kind of instability problem. I should maybe do some linear instability analysis and try and understand what the wrinkle wavelength and where the wrinkles are and so on. What I'd hope to be able to show you in this talk is that actually that's not quite the right way of thinking for some of these applications where the wrinkles are really uh, well beyond the kind of onset conditions. So I think the, the place to start is uh, by just making sure that everyone's up to speed with what's going on and why wrinkling happens. And the basic idea is that you have some thin layers uh, that are being compressed. And they can be compressed either by the application of an external force. So if I take a, a sheet of paper and then compress it, uh, that's one way. But also it can be sort of forced upon the system. And you can see this, uh, an example of this, if you take a bunch of grapes and then let them um, dry over a series of uh, 40 to 50 days, I think. What you see is that the, the center of the grape is uh, evaporating, drying out, and the skin does not dry out to the same extent. And so it finds itself with too much length compared to the volume that's left. And so it has to wrinkle to do that, to accommodate that. So what we're going to need to be able to do is to be able to talk about 
the different responses to compression. And as I've sort of already indicated, one of those is to buckle out of plane. A sort of more, uh, a sort of an alternative is to actually change length. So if I take this sheet of paper and then try to push it, if I don't push too hard, then actually I can sort of imagine the sheet actually changing its length. So I imagine a sheet with thickness T, length L, and I'm gonna end, apply some end compression delta L, okay? Now, of course, actually what we expect the sheet to do in some situation is to bend. And the key advantage of bending is that I can kind of uh, waste that length. So I can keep my center line uh, shown by this dosh, dated, uh, dashed curve here. I can keep that length the same OK, albeit at the expense of uh, stretching the outer surface and compressing the inner surface. OK, so there is some small scale compression and tension going on, but kind of at the large scale, I'm keeping the length of the center line the same. So there's a kind of easy calculation to, to sort of estimate what the ratio or the, what the energetic penalties of those two modes of deformation are. Uh, and if you do that, then what you find is that the ratio of the energy of changing length, what I call UCL, compared to the energy of bending, scales is sort of is determined geometrically, as you might expect, but it scales as the length times the amount of compression delta L divided by the thickness squared. Again, if I'm thinking about a very thin sheet of paper, clearly the thickness compared to the length is extremely small. Okay, so if I imagine taking the limit of the thickness tending to zero, then I would expect uh, situation. I'd expect objects to deform as wherever possible without changing their length. So I'd be inspired to think about what isometric deformations are possible. And again, it's well known to many of you, but um, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page, as Gauss's remarkable theorem states that if you are a surface uh, deforming under local isometry, then you cannot change the Gaussian curvature of that surface. So if I think about uh, the, a banana, for example, I can think about what the Gaussian curvature of a banana is. Gaussian curvature is defined to be the product of the principal curvatures of a surface. So uh, here I've got a, a curvature with a center of curvature up here somewhere. So I might call that a negative curvature. And then the curvature around the circumference of the banana, I would call a positive curvature. The Gaussian curvature in that case would be negative. But as I move around the surface of the banana, the curvature, the Gaussian curvature, and the sign of the Gaussian curvature will change. Okay, so Gauss's theorem tells me that I'm not allowed to change the Gaussian curvature of a thin piece of paper, or rather, if I do change the Gaussian curvature, then I'm going to have to pay by stretching that surface, and we've already seen that stretching the surface is very expensive energetically. So sort of everyday corollary of this is that if I take my thin, a thin piece of paper and try to stick it onto my head for want of a better spherical object, um, then you see that actually I end up having to make lots of creases in the piece of paper. Okay, and that's localized regions of stretching. Okay, and that's just because the piece of paper had Gaussian curvature of zero. It was flat in both directions. Whereas my head has positive Gaussian curvature, it's curved in both directions and the product then is positive. Okay, so you know this already, you know that if I make a map of the Earth's surface, I have to distort some areas um, differently because I cannot make a 2D representation of the spherical surface of the Earth. And if you have kids, then you also know that every time you try to stick a plaster onto, the surf onto a knee, then you end up with regions where the plaster decides that it's unhappy and so it peels away with these what are called delamination blisters okay now there are a class of deformations that are allowed here i'm allowed to, to stay cylindrical because if i if i do this then i'm flat in this direction so i have zero curvature in this direction i have some finite curvature in the other direction but the product of the two curvatures is still zero and hence the gaussian curvature remains zero so cylindrical deformations are a special class of deformations that keep zero Gaussian curvature. And that's what I'm going to focus on to start with. OK, so I'm going to focus on cylindrical wrinkling, uh, but I'm going to start by doing a sort of more detailed version of the, of the experiment that I've just been talking about or analysis of that experiment, which is to think about the elastica. OK, so this is a, a classic problem, uh, at least two centuries old, where you sort of think about what is the shape that this card uh, takes when I compress it. 
And the idea is, as we've seen, that the center line won't change its length, but I'd like to be able to say something about its shape. And so I'd like to think about uh, a variational principle for that shape. So if I think about what the energy of deformation is, I can argue just by symmetry that it should be quadratic in the curvature, okay? The, the sheet doesn't care about where it is vertically in space. It doesn't care about what angle it's at. It only cares about whether it's curved or not. And moreover, it doesn't care whether it's curved like this or like this. So it only cares about the square of the curvature. Now, obviously, if I try to minimize this energy, I'm going to find that the, the sheet should be flat, that it should have zero curvature. So I need to impose some constraint that tells it it's got to not be flat. And that's this co combination of geometry and inextensibility. What I say is that the, uh, the sort of the horizontal projected length, so the length minus the amount of horizontal compression I applied, it's got to be equal to the integral of uh, cos theta over the arc length. Okay, and that enters as a Lagrange multiplier in my variational principle. And when I do that, I end up with the well-known elastic equation, which is also um, the pendulum equation, where the Lagrange multiplier associated with, um, with the constraint of inextensibility P corresponds to the compressive force that I'm applying here. Okay, so just for this part of the talk, a positive P is going to correspond to a compression. Okay, so you can do a sort of um, standard kind of linearized analysis of this problem. You can say, okay, I want to linearize the sine theta to just be a theta. I'm gonna apply some clamping boundary conditions and I'm gonna linear, or not linearize, but take the leading order term in this constraint and then solve the problem. And you can find then what the shape of the buckled elastica is. And you can also find what the compressive force that you need to apply is, okay? You can go a little bit further than that um, and calculate actually what the correction to the compressive force is. Uh, but the key things that I'm interested in are A, that the, the amplitude of the elastica, so this, this large A here, the height, okay, which goes like the, like the square root of the amount of compression that's been applied. And also the correction to the pressure. So the, pressure, the, the force that I need to apply this P is essentially a constant value four pi squared, but there's a linear correction that you can determine with this weekly nonlinear analysis. But the key two, the two key takeaways are essentially that I can work out what the amplitude of this uh, bump has to be just by arguing that I, it needs to waste a certain amount of length. I give it some delta L and it's got to waste that length in the third dimension. The second takeaway, is that the applied force, the force that I have to apply to impose that, impose that compression, increases with increasing compression. Okay, now the sort of big caveat with all of this is that I told you that I'm going to talk about wrinkling and I've just spent the last five minutes talking about something that is clearly not wrinkling because it deforms over the whole system size. Okay, so it's not, it's not doing anything that we'd recognize as wrinkling. To get something that wrinkles, we need a little bit more physics. And I think the simplest problem that you can consider is basically the same problem in the sheet here, but now floating on the surface of water. And the reason that that's sort of interesting is because now if I try to compress it and it buckles up in the way that I expect from Euler's Elastica, then you'll expect to see just one big bump, okay? And that might be good from a sort of bending energy point of view, it minimizes the curvature, so it minimizes the bending energy, but it's very expensive in terms of gravitational potential energy. The alternative, given that I've got to waste a fixed amount of length, is to have lots of really, really fine scale wrinkles, okay, many small bumps. And while that might be better because it reduces the amplitude, that might be better from a gravitational point of view, it's very expensive in terms of bending the film because I've now got really high curvature. So again, you can write down a variational principle, which is to minimize the sum of the curvature and the gravitational potential energy subject to this compression constraint. And what you find is that there's sort of an optimal wavelength, which is related to the bending stiffness of the sheet, the density of the liquid and the gravitational acceleration with this one quarter power. 
Now, that's one way of thinking about this problem, but another way of thinking about this problem is really based on force balance. And so you can say I have a, a linearized beam equation, but with a hydrostatic pressure. So this is just like my elastica equation with a hydrostatic pressure. And then you can say, well, I'm, I want wrinkled solutions. So I want solutions that have a cos uh, with some wavelength lambda. And if I just rearrange this equation to give me what the compressive force P has to be to get a particular wavelength, then you see that it's non-monotonic and there's a minimum force that's required to get a wrinkled uh, solution. And that, that and you can easily determine what that uh, minimum force is and what the corresponding um, wrinkle wavelength is. And you'll see that it's exactly the same as what I just derived uh, via my energetic approach a second ago. Uh, and in some ways, that's well. Uh, what I'm going to try and show you is that that's actually just a feature of the 1D problem. Compressing things in 1D makes these two approaches agree very well. But what I'd like to argue is that that's actually not just a blessing, but also a curse. OK, so if 1D is too boring or, or not sufficiently interesting, maybe we should try and go uh, to axisymmetry. And I'll do that in a second. I uh, also want to talk a little bit about what happens beyond onset. So experiments actually show that uh, if you start off with a sheet that's very finely wrinkled and then compress a little bit further, actually you see this dark region uh, appearing in the movie here and that corresponds to one very large fold with very small wrinkles elsewhere. Now, if you want to understand that, you need to go beyond the linear theory that I've sort of presented so far. Uh, and the way to do that is to write down the geometrically nonlinear equation for the angle of inclination. Somewhat miraculously, this equation actually has an analytical solution, um, which is related to the solution of the elastica, because again, this equation is related to the nonlinear elastica equation. But what's really important about this solution is that it tells us what the compressive force is. We showed in our linear analysis that the compressive force had to take a dimensionless value of two at the threshold. But what this nonlinear problem tells us is that actually the compressive force decreases as I increase the compression beyond onset. And that's different to what I found in the elastica. In the elastica, I found that as I compress more, I need to uh, apply more force. Okay, so as I said, I want to talk about axisymmetric wrinkling uh, and the sort of, um, the sort of analog of the elastica problem there is to think about what's called the Lame problem. So you imagine having uh, an annulus, okay, with some central hole of radius r in. I'm going to imagine that the outer radius of that annulus goes to infinity just to make the algebra nicer. And I'm going to imagine that the outer tension that's applied is some t out and the inner tension is some t in. Okay. Now, essentially, if I if the sort of first thing to do is to work out what the stress is within this, within this annulus. In the problem of the elastica, because it's 1D, I'm solving div sigma equals zero. If there's no stress in this direction, then I've got to just have a constant stress in the X direction. In axisymmetry, things are a bit more interesting. So if I have, I actually have to do a calculation of what div sig, sigma equals zero tells me. And it tells me that I have this constant uh, background tension T out, moderated by something that decays algebraically um, with radial position compared to the inner radius. If I just sort of sketch what that stress field looks like, I find that the hoop stress does something interesting. And the key parameter is what I call tau. It's the ratio of the internal tension to the external tension T, T out. If that value is less than two, then sigma theta theta is everywhere positive, okay? And now I've changed my sign convention, so a positive tension, well, is, is a tension, the, the system is in tension. At a critical value of two, actually sigma theta theta gets to zero at the inner boundary of the hole. And then as soon as I go to tensions above two, I start to go a little bit negative. And so what I expect to see is some compression within just outside the hole, so in some inner annulus. And the sort of scale of that um, compressive region is the square root of the ratio of the tensions with a, with a minus one. OK, so now that I've calculated the sort of stress profile, it's very easy to go back and sort of try and do the analog of the Euler-Buckling analysis to work out 
exactly how much beyond two tau has to be to get wrinkling, how much compression can this hoop withstand before it wrinkles, okay? And that's exactly what you can do. It's a, it's a sort of fairly straightforward calculation, um, but it's not very easy to present over Zoom. So I'm just gonna give you the sort of scaling version of this. But the key ingredient is basically that you know that the, the theta, the azimuthal compression is basically linear close to the inner edge of the hole, okay? The second key ingredient is that the number of wrinkles is very large, or at least in the problems that uh, I'm gonna present here. And that means that the sort of, the contribution from the bending stiffness is really dominated by the azimuthal derivative. So I can sort of estimate the size of this term here, the first term uh, being, as being the quartic in the wrinkle number. From my linear extrapolation of the stress, I can also estimate how much this compressive term is gonna give me. And then finally, I also have some radial tension, which I can, again, estimate at a scaling level. And if I require all of these terms to balance, then I find that the wrinkle number goes like a small parameter epsilon to the minus three eighths. Epsilon is what measures how bent, how what the bending stiffness is. So it's the bending stiffness divided by the applied external tension times the radius squared. And generally in the problems I'm going to talk about, it's extremely small. So order 10 to the minus six or even smaller. Now, what we find is, as I said, that the wrinkle number goes like epsilon to the minus three eighths, and that the change, that the amount of compression, the delta tor that can be withstood before wrinkling happens, goes like epsilon to the one quarter. Now, as I said, you can actually do this calculation properly. I think that was first done by Cyprian Coman, uh, who found essentially found the prefactors in all of these scalings in terms of the first root of an airy function. Um, but I don't want to go into that because at a, more or less the same time, there were some experiments that are on a very, or what seems to be a very similar problem. So these experiments were also sort of at least qualitatively look a lot like the problems where people are interested in cells crawling across substrates and measuring forces that way. But instead of measuring, uh, looking at cells crawling on thin sheets, they were actually looking at liquid droplets. So this is a drop of water placed on an extremely thin uh, elastic sheet. So to give you a sense of the scale here, the thickness is on the order of 40 nanometers. The radial scale is of the sheet is um, on the order of a centimeter. So the aspect ratio of the sheet is on the order of 10 to the five. Now, as I said, the sheet is floating on the surface of water. So there's a capillary or surface tension pulling at the edge of the sheet. That's gonna play the role of my T out okay, that I had in my Lame problem. And there's no direct T in here. What we have instead is a droplet sitting on the surface with a Laplace pressure inside it kind of pushing down on the sheet. And just to be clear, these drops are very small. They're below a millimeter in radius. So the weight of the droplet is really negligible in what I'm discussing here. Now these, um, this paper was really interested in a similar problem to the to the cell walking. They were really interested in, if I look at the wrinkle length here, can I tell you what the thickness of the sheet is? And what they found uh, empirically is that the length of the wrinkles normalized by the radius of the internal hole or the droplet goes like the ratio of the Young's modulus times the thickness divided by surface tension to the power of a half. And again, empirically, they found that the wrinkle wavelength goes like epsilon to the minus a quarter, where epsilon is what I defined uh, on the last slide. The bet is essentially the bending stiffness of the sheet. Now, it's very tempting uh, and to, to sort of think, well, maybe I can use my calculation of the Lame problem to understand this experiment. You might remember that I said the, the region that's compressed in the Lame problem scales like essentially like the square root of the two tensions in the problem. Uh, unfortunately, the, the scaling for the wavelength is, or the wave number of instability is very slightly different, minus three eighths rather than minus a quarter, but maybe that's just a, a sort of experimental error. I mean, you could imagine that that's the quarter and three eighths are not so far apart. There's actually sort of a, a bigger problem, okay? While this, while this exponent one half that the Lame problem has kind of looks like the exponent one half that's in the experiment, there's kind of a slightly weird paradox. I said already that the analog of T out in this problem has to be surface tension here. Okay, that's the tension that's applied at the edge of the sheet 
So it seems natural to say T out has to be gamma. But then that means if I'm going to get this scaling that's observed experimentally, then the internal tension T in has to just be the Young's modulus and the thickness of the sheet, and then has to be independent of the drop, has to be completely independent of the drop. And that seems very strange because it's the presence of the drop that's causing the wrinkling in the first place. So what I'd like to think a little bit about is what's going on there. Okay, so you might think, well, maybe it's because, um, you know, something interesting is happening under the drop. And in particular, the region underneath the drop is observed to be axisymmetric, not wrinkled. So as I told you at the beginning, if you keep, um, if you have a very, if you have a sheet that is uh, thin, it doesn't want to stretch. But if you make it, uh, if you make it have Gaussian curvature, it's going to have to stretch. And if you stay axisymmetric, then you have to stretch. Okay, so question one is, well, how much do you have to stretch? And a very simple argument based on Pythagoras' theorem tells you that you have to change, if you lift up by an amount delta, you have to change your length uh, by an amount delta squared over your horizontal length scale. And that means that you have a strain that scales like delta squared over r squared. That means in terms that you have an induced tension that is proportional to the Young's modulus times the thickness times this strain. Okay, delta squared over r squared. So I could uh, maybe go back and say, well, I, that's all very nice, but I haven't told you what delta is in this problem. I've just told you there's a drop sitting on top of the sheet. So I need to estimate that. And to do that, I need, okay, the bit of geometry I've just told you that the strain goes like delta d squared over r squared or the angle at the edge squared. I need another bit of geometry. And again, I, I do do this uh, properly, but just in terms of scalings, you can say that I imagine that the bit underneath the drop has to be roughly a spherical cap. And so the angle of the, at the edge is going to scale like the radius of the drop compared to the radius of curvature that it adopts. And so far, I only have geometry. I don't have any physics. So the one bit of physics I need is Laplace's law, which says that the tension in the sheet underneath the drop times its curvature has to balance the pressure inside the drop, which itself is given by Laplace's law to be the surface tension of the drop times the curvature of the drop. And so you've got three ingredients. You can sort of eliminate everything from this. You find that the angle phi involves gamma, the surface tension, Young's modulus thickness with a slightly exotic one third exponent. And you find that there's a typical tension in the membrane that goes like gamma to the two thirds, Young's modulus times thickness to the one third. Okay, so there's a, the, the droplet being on the surface induces a kind of characteristic tension scale. And then I can go back to my Lame problem and say, okay, now I, now I definitely know what the internal tension is. I did this droplet calculation. Uh, okay, I've only told you the scaling laws here, but maybe I can actually do the calculation and work out a prefactored beta. And the problem with that is that if I then look at experimental data for where what the wrinkle length is as a function of this internal tension T star normalized by T out, then my theory, including all the relevant prefactors, gives me this dashed curve and the experiments are way off. Okay, so the theory significantly underestimates what's seen experimentally. And you might be tempted then to think, well, maybe it's because the sheets were had too high a bending stiffness or something else like that. Actually, these sheets, as I said, are very bendable, so that's not right. The key is really to look and notice that my analysis is really based on the assumption that I'm very close to threshold. And threshold in these units is somewhere around four, whereas my smallest experiment was around 11 or 12. So my smallest tension is at least two times the critical tension for wrinkling, and I go way up to more than 10 times the critical tension for wrinkling, okay? So I'm way, way, way beyond threshold. My linear analysis isn't really valid. And what I hope to show you now is that actually that wrinkling changes the stress qualitatively. So the question is, if we want to try and understand this, well, what should we actually do and how should we describe these wrinkle patterns? And the key idea is has sort of two parts. The first part is, as I told you in the Elastica problem, that you've got to waste length. You're doing some compression, you've got to buckle out of plane. Now, it turns out that the amount of um, length you have to waste needs to be determined as part of the problem. 
but the key thing is that that's some quantity. It's an order one quantity as the thickness tends to zero. Okay. What about the stuff on the left hand side? This is just my amount of compression, but taking account of the fact that I'm now working on a circle. Okay. Now, the key thing is that whenever I differentiate with respect to theta, I introduce a wrinkle number m. And then the second key idea is that this m is really, really large. Okay. Um, you saw in those pictures that there were maybe, you know, 100 or 200 wrinkles. So every time I differentiate, I multiply by a factor of 100 or so on. And so when I think about taking the limit of zero bending stiffness or wrinkle number tends to infinity, I've got to make sure that the wrinkle amplitude tends to zero in the right way. I've got to make sure that this wasting length constraint is exactly satisfied. And that means that I've got to have the wrinkle amplitude going to zero in the right way. Okay. So I've said that the wrinkle number is, uh, is a large number, then that means I need a small parameter. A good choice of small parameter is one over the wrinkle number. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm basically gonna do an expansion in powers of one over the wrinkle number. I'm gonna say for the moment that there's some sort of mean shape that's actually symmetric. I'll come back to that in a second. It's not really relevant for what I'm discussing right now, but there's some wrinkle amplitude that goes like one over M. And that just ensures that when I differentiate this cos m theta, I magically cancel the m's and I can guarantee that my zeta one of r is gonna be an order one quantity. I do the same thing for my stress, okay? And there I'm just gonna pause and I'm gonna think about what happens with my energy minimization because I haven't said anything about what this m is doing in terms of the control parameters of the system, particularly the bending stiffness. So again, my energy minimization has a bending stiffness term, so this is bending times curvature, squared, sorry, the square root of curvature. And there's also uh, a term that's quadratic in the displacement coming from the displacement of liquid underneath the sheet. So if I estimate the size of these terms, B or epsilon is my dimensionless bending stiffness. When I differentiate with respect to theta twice, I get an M squared, but zeta was order one over M. So actually I just have an M and then I square it. So I have an epsilon M squared. My zeta squared ends up being an M to the minus two. And then you can see that a natural choice if I want to minimize energy is actually to choose the wrinkle number to be order epsilon to the minus a quarter. Okay, so I'm kind of doing these approaches kind of in parallel. Now I go back to my sort of force balance approach and I find that actually my hoop stress has to vanish at the first two orders. And that's really important because it means that sigma theta theta, the hoop stress, has to be much, much smaller than the radial stress. And it's really that thing that is different between 1D and 2D. In my 1D compression, I only have compression along the direct, you know, in a particular direction, uh, when zero stress in the other direction, in these axisymmetric problems, while I might have sigma theta theta being zero, my radial stress can be, um, can be non-trivial. And indeed, when I go back to div sigma equals zero, I find that that sigma r r has to be one over r. So that's a significant change uh, from what's going on in, in the sort of lame, in the sort of near threshold lame problem. Okay, so again, just to emphasize this, if I take my, my Lame solution look, with these dashed curves, it kind of went nicely through the x-axis and then kind of tended to one at infinity. But actually, what I need to do is I need to relax the stress, have sigma theta theta zero in some region, and then allow that to increase in an unwrinkled region uh, up to some value. And uh, so, I mean, we're sort of used to thinking about uh, a normal membrane is having stresses in the two directions that are sort of similar orders of magnitude. Actually, what one might say you should think about this as being is more like a spider's web. Okay, a wrinkled membrane is a bit more like a spider's web in that in the, in the radial direction, things are tensile, but in the hoop direction, everything is slack. Okay, so you just cannot support any compression at all. Uh, so, as I said, that gives you the, the radial stress goes like one over R. So, at some level, this is kind of well known. It's what's also referred to as relaxed energy functional or tension field theory. But a key difference about what I'm describing here is that actually you do still get what the energy of wrinkles is, and that enters at kind of higher order 
at order epsilon to the one half in your expansion. And you can use that to actually determine what the property, what sort of microscopic properties are. So in particular, the wrinkle number. So just quickly to revisit the Lamey problem that I talked about uh, already, we say that there's, there's a wrinkled region inside and an unwrinkled region outside. The stress inside has this one over R dependence. The stress outside is still the Lamey behavior. And when I, ex when I make sure that the stresses match at the wrinkled region, at the boundary of the wrinkled region, then I find that the length of the wrinkles is now, instead of being the square root of the ratio of tensions, it's linear in the tensions. So if I go back to my experimental data, what I see is that that gives a much better account of the experimental data. Okay. Uh, and just to remind you that the sort of linear stability prediction pushed inappropriately far, admittedly, was this dashed curve. Okay. So that gave you a square root. So I think this is important because it sort of says that if you're interested in actually trying to measure forces, so measuring T star by observing the wrinkle length, then you're going to massively overestimate the forces that are being imposed by, for example, these uh, keratocytes, if you use um, the, sort of non, the sort of linear theory inappropriately. Okay, so what I've been talking about so far is all kind of in the plane. There are fine wrinkles on something that would otherwise be flat. But I really, I sort of started out by telling you that things out of plane are kind of badly behaved. So you can sort of imagine that if I now force things to have some out of plane displacement underneath the wrinkles, so that's my kind of mean shape zeta bar of R being non-zero, then I would intrinsically be forcing the thing to have non-zero Gaussian curvature. And so I've got a difficult choice to make, right? If I'm a, sh if I'm a thin sheet, I've got to choose, do I either break axisymmetry but remain uh, remain isometric? So you can do that if you take a sheet and try to push it into a cup. Then what you get is what's called a D cone, a developable cone, which has zero curvature kind of in the radial direction, but can do whatever it wants in the theta direction whilst maintaining zero Gaussian curvature. Or the difficult, the, the second choice in this dichotomy is that you break isometry, you let yourself stretch. And we've already talked a little bit about what the strain that you have to induce is. So the question is, well, what happens uh, to these bendable sheets? If I try and force them to have some Gaussian curvature, what, what will I see? So again, the simplest way that you can, well, that I can think of to do this is to take one of these very thin, sort of 100 nanometer thin sheets floating on the surface of water, and then just to try to lift it at a point. Okay, so I apply a point force at the center, and I expect that I'm gonna lift it up. So if I do, if I get a deformation that looks like what I've drawn here, then you would expect there to be some Gaussian curvature. And given what I've told you already, if there's Gaussian curvature, there must be stretching. And so I must estimate what that stretching energy is. Crucially, it depends on the Young's modulus and the thickness of the sheet. And then I can also estimate what force I need to apply in this pulling to give me a particular height delta of this, of lifting, poking. And what I find is that that indentation force should be cubic in the indentation depth or in the lifting depth. Okay, so it should be cubic in delta and it should be linear in the thickness. Okay, but it turns out that that's actually an experiment that was done a decade ago by Doug Holmes, now Crosby at uh, UMass Amherst. And they found that both of those expectations are actually wrong. Okay, so they did the experiment with... Um, a very variety of thicknesses here. I've got uh, data for three different thicknesses varying over more than an order of magnitude. And what you see is that the force is linear in indentation depth and that the, and that the stiffness, the prefactor in that linear relationship doesn't depend on the thickness. Okay, so sort of two of my expectations from the simple scaling law are wrong. And the question is, well, how is this possible? In particular, if I'm thinking of that, I'm imposing some Gaussian curvature, then I must be stretching the sheet. And if I'm stretching the sheet, then I must be probing somehow the Young's modulus and the thickness of the sheet, the sort of the, the resistance to stretching. So these are sort of later experiments um, done by Joey Paulson now at Syracuse. Um, and the top movie shows you the view from the top and then the bottom movie would show you 
the side view, except I obscured it. So you can see that he's lifting up the sheet from below. Now, what you can see from the side view is that the shape looks roughly actually symmetric. Obviously, you can't quite tell that, but you can see that it's not doing something like the decone. And the thing that you can see from the top view is that actually wrinkles are very quickly reaching the edge of the sheet, apart from a small region in the centre, which remains unwrinkled. Now, we can calculate where the wrinkles are as a function of how high and so on, uh, but I don't want to talk about that now. What I want to talk about first is why does wrinkling happen? Okay, so what's happening here is that you start out with a sheet that is isotropically stretched uh, and subject to an isotropic and homogeneous stress, which is just a surface tension of the sheet. And so it's essentially indistinguishable from the liquid meniscus. Uh, and if, if I were to deform it, then I would expect it to deform over the capillary length, LC. Um, it turns out that poking modifies that stress if you get to a critical indentation depth. And what that modification looks like is that the stress gets very large near where you're poking. The radial stress decays very nicely, but the hoop stress actually becomes relatively compressive. Okay, I'm basically I'm pulling up, bringing stuff in, and it becomes compressed. If I keep on poking, then eventually that stress actually becomes absolutely negative, compressive, okay? And so what we see is actually that we should have some wrinkling in an annulus. And as I said already, the asymptotic calculation reveals that wrinkling very quickly reaches the edge of the sheet, um, but there's a small core region that stays forever. Okay, you can sort of calculate what the sheet shape should look like. Just as a point of comparison, I'm taking this stress to be um, the wrinkled stress and then using the vertical force balance. If you're sort of familiar with surface tension, then you would imagine that I'd get the Laplace-Young equation and thereby get it get modified Bessel functions. Here, what I want to do is I want to cross off the sigma theta theta. And so what I end up with instead is Aries equation. So I expect my sheet shape to look like an airy function with a horizontal length scale that depends on the radius of the film and the capillary length. And that's exactly what we see uh, experimentally as well. The data with different sheet thicknesses, different indentation heights and so on, all collapse onto the, this airy function. And crucially, that is independent of thickness, which gives us a clue about the force result that I was showing you earlier. So I can calculate that force just by integrating the stress times by the sort of sine of the angle. And what I find is that there's a constant uh, stiffness, which depends on um, the surface tension, density, gravity, and radius of the film, but is exactly independent, is crucially is independent of the thickness and the Young's modulus. And that's a, a, a prediction that was recently um, verified experimentally as well. Okay, so what's going on? Why is a curved shape allowed? Now that we've calculated what this curved shape is, we can sort of calculate how much energy it should cost and what the profile of the energy is. So here I'm plotting the strain energy density and the gravitational potential energy density of the liquid. And what you see is that in the inner region, this tensile region where there is no wrinkling, that strain energy is large. But the key thing is that the size of that region is getting smaller and smaller as the indentation depth gets larger. Whereas 99% of the sheet is paying predominantly a gravitational potential energy penalty from the fact that you lifted up a load of liquid. And it's that gravitational potential energy that dominates, uh, at least if you're in a particular region where you have weak surface tension, so you're not actually stretching the sheet radially, and the bending stiffness is sufficiently small that you can form very fine wrinkles. Um, so if the, both the thickness and the surface tension become very small, this wrinkled membrane approaches a new isometric shape, what I call a wrinkly isometry. Uh, in view of time, I think I might skip talking about what the energy of wrinkling itself is. But the key thing is that actually it turns out to be the curvature of the sheet that determines what the wrinkle number is. So I'll just, sorry. Uh, so it turns out that we can actually sort of calculate what the wrinkle number is as a function of indentation depth if you're at a fixed position or uh, radial position as you change the indentation depth. And the key thing is that the wrinkle number or the wrinkle wavelength change spatially. I'll come back and talk about that very briefly um, at the end. 
But again, the key thing is that this doesn't change this energy of this wrinkles, uh, does not change the energetic structure that I just described to you a second ago. The wrinkle, the, the energy is really dominated by the gravitational potential energy of the liquid that you're lifting. Again, just quickly, I want to show you another example, which is motivated by what happens when you poke uh, shells that are pressurized. So thinking about what happens when you check whether your bike tire is inflated, what the um, pressure inside a, a viral capsid is or inside a polymerosome or a cell that's swollen by turgor pressure. Basically, again, you're doing this poking and measuring what the force compared to the displacement is. Now, so historically, it's um, assumed that this deformation should happen isometrically by what's called mirror buckling. If I take a cap of a tennis ball and turn it inside out, I preserve Gaussian curvature, and so that's an allowed isometry. And you can do the same thing with a shell. It turns out that, the, um, that this is actually an isometry, except at the region where there's sort of a cusp here, and that cusp is smoothed out by a boundary layer, which is called a Pogorelov ridge, and the size of that boundary layer vanishes as the thickness tends to zero. So crucially, the elastic energy of deformation vanishes as thickness goes to zero, so mirror buckling is a free lunch. Now, maybe it won't be surprising, as Alan said at the beginning, you've seen my beach ball wrinkling. You know that wrinkling happens here. The key thing is that the, that modifies the force um, that is measured compared to what you'd expect from mirror buckling. Uh, and so the question then is, well, why does the system not take the free lunch that's apparently available to it? You can do, again, the same sort of calculation that I did with the airy function for the floating sheet. You find a different shape um, in, that you can sort of calculate analytically. But the key thing, again, is that this shape doesn't end up costing you, asymptotically at least, does not cost you energy, um, provided that your indentation depths are large, but not too large. Okay, so there's a very precise way in which I mean this. But what you find is that actually there's another example of this wrinkly isometry, I call it. And the key thing is that then what matters is not how much elastic energy it costs you to deform, but how much gas you compress, uh, your PDV, if you like. And it just turns out that this wrinkled shape displaces less gas than the mirror buckled shape, and so is energetically favourable. Okay, um, I think I've talked too much about wrinkle numbers. If people want to know about that, I can come back to it later. What I want to talk about is, um, first of all, again, whether you can make whatever ga change to Gaussian curvature you like. Um, the examples I've shown you so far have a Gaussian curvature that's negative. So you might wonder whether it's possible to make a positive Gaussian curvature. Um, so for example, by sticking a sheet onto a soft sphere, and this is an experiment that Lucy Domino is currently doing in the lab. Um, she's allowed back into the lab as part of the return to work pilot. Um, but basically she's spinning a liquid bath to make a parabola and then sticking one of these sheets onto the surface and getting a wrinkled uh, parabola. And what she sees is again, a curved shape with wrinkles. Uh, this is very preliminary work, but what you can see already is that actually this ansatz of the constant wrinkle number is not quite right. There's some amplitude modulation that's happening as you go round, and I'll talk very briefly about that right at the end. Okay, so what I've shown you now is several examples in which you get a mean shape or a gross shape that has Gaussian curvature, but based on what I told you at the beginning, you should expect that that would mean that I'd have to have significant elastic strain. Anytime I have Gaussian curvature, I have significant strain. So the question then is, well, if that's not right, then what's wrong with Gauss's theorem? What, what have I broken here? Well, the answer is, of course, that I've broken nothing. I've been focusing just on this mean shape, the shape underneath the wrinkles. And really what's happening is that that shape is allowed to curve to form Gaussian curvature precisely because wrinkling allows it to get rid of any extra length that it needs to very easily. And as a very simple example of that is if you take, you imagine having an open umbrella like you would have done earlier today. And then when you, so in the open configuration, this has positive Gaussian curvature. When I close it, it has a conical shape and so hence has zero Gaussian curvature, but I haven't got rid of any length here. All I've done is formed massive folds in between the spokes of the umbrella, okay? 
So what you might say is that the excess length or the excess area is being buffered by the buckling. OK, and of course, that's very easy when you close an umbrella. What I think is surprising here maybe is that, first of all, the buffering structure emerges spontaneously. In the umbrella example, you had to put spokes in the right places, whereas in the wrinkled examples, that's the system sort of works out where to do it. And then finally, that the, the second thing that I think is interesting is that the wrinkling allows you to have some curvature. But at the same time, and I didn't talk about it because of time, but the curvature controls what the wrinkle wavelength you're going to get is. Okay, so I started off the talk by thinking a little bit about variational principles, and then I showed you that that was maybe misleading in a few ways. So now the question is, what's the right variational principle? It's not that the mean shape has to be isometric to what you started with, but rather that it should be a short map. So I can change the distance between any two points, provided that it, that change is a decrease. OK, and that means that you can get some slightly interesting variational principles. So you can imagine saying, OK, I want to ma maximize the volume that I can fit inside a tortilla wrap uh, with a fixed radius. And how should I do that? There are various different ways you could imagine. You could imagine staying roughly axisymmetric, which would be something like this phyllo parcel. You could imagine maybe having a threefold symmetry, which would be a Somoza. Or you could imagine having like a twofold symmetry, which would be maybe an empanada or a pasty. And the question is, which of these actually maximizes the volume? Um, it turns out that the phyllo parcel uh, is the worst and the empanada is the best. But actually using this kind of uh, construct of the short map, you can sort of get the system to find by itself just by taking one of these very thin sheets, having a drop in it and then gradually decreasing the volume you can get it to spontaneously find this optimum pasty shape. Again, variation principles are interesting, um, give you some new insights into wrinkled patterns. So there's been some recent work on what happens if I have a spherical shell and then I cut a square out of that shell and force it to be flat. Okay, so again, a change in apparent Gaussian curvature, I would expect there to be wrinkles, but the question is where do the wrinkles form? And it turns out that because of this short map idea, there's a very simple um, geometrical construction, which I understand. I don't understand the reason properly, uh, but I can give you the construction, which is that you take the square that you have, you do, uh, you calculate the inscribed cir circle, and then you calculate where that inscribed circle touches your boundary. And you join, you form the polygon that joins those points, which here is just a square rotated by pi by four. And then you say that inside that square, the wrinkle pattern will be disordered. And outside that square, there will be wrinkles that are aligned with that edge of the boundary. So that, so based on this variational principle, again, this is not my work, but very based on this variational principle, you expect wrinkles to be aligned in this way. And indeed, experimentally, that's exactly what's seen. OK, so there are a number of open questions, uh, including what happens as you go, as you sort of compress wrinkles further, you end up with something called crumples. Uh, a lot of the, our work in the, uh, in the group at the moment is thinking about how wrinkles respond to geometrical frustration. The examples I showed you had neither a constant wavelength nor a constant wave number. So the question is, how do you deal with that? You might deal with it by having ampl amplitude modulations. You have to in have defects, and those defects may or may not be ordered. So this is another experiment that Lucy's doing in the lab, where you see regions with very ordered wrinkles with defects, kind of separating those ordered regions. Or you might, sorry, that's highlighting the defects. Or you might have a cascade where you go from low numbers of wrinkles to successively higher and higher numbers of wrinkles. And then I'm not sure whether it's an interesting question. I'm oh, sorry, yeah, you can you can do multiple scales and that's to understand something about this amplitude modulation. So finally, I'm not sure if it's an interesting question, but I think this question about what allowed shapes are you allowed or can you make with these short maps is kind of interesting. Gauss's theorem is clearly too crude because I've shown you examples where the Gaussian curvature can change. What can you say anything general? OK, so just to finish, there are two take home messages that I'd like people to, to have. The first is that when you have wrinkles, it's not really, you, or at least in these very bendable sheets, it's not really that useful to think about uh, 
the threshold, the linear stability calculation that you might want to, particularly because that means wrinkles change the stress qualitatively and propagate much further than you might expect. And the second take home message is that wrinkling in these very bendable sheets allows you to change length or appear to change length very cheaply. So you can change your apparent Gaussian curvature very cheaply. But interestingly, I think you can change the wrinkle, the wrinkle pattern is really determined by the curvature that, that you have, that it facilitates, yeah. Okay, so that's it. Um, obviously the work was done by lots of people except me, um, most notably at Oxford, Matteo, Lucy uh, Deeran, who's now in Limerick, and also Finn, who's now in Manchester. Uh, and various people have funded this work. Thank you very much.